a show about using water in the garden coming up next. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. We've got a lot going on in the garden today. I'm getting lots of things planted, sort of filling in some beds. But the focus on today's show is about one of the most mesmerizing components you can add to any garden, and that's water. In the show, we'll take a look at ways water can add beauty and tranquility to your garden, as well as how you can keep water from causing erosion. We'll also take a look at a very inventive self-watering container and the benefits of using rainwater for your plants. Plus, we'll turn this old galvanized tub into a decorative water cooler and make an ice bowl made with herbs. And for a relaxing evening after a stressful day, we'll make this easy homemade herbal bath blend. Well, as you can see, we have a lot to cover in today's show. So why don't we get started focusing on heat and drought tolerant plants. When the rain stops falling and temperatures begin to soar, it's time to come to the rescue to some of your fading flowers and some of those water-starved vegetables. Now, whether you're experiencing just a short dry spell or struggling with deepening drought, there's plenty you can do to help your plants survive even during the hot dog days of summer. For instance, you might think about placing your plants with similar water requirements together so you don't waste moisture on plants that don't really need it or neglect plants that actually do. Some heat tolerant annual flowers that will stay bright and showy no matter how steamy it gets include marigolds, dusty miller, lantana, salvia, sunflowers, periwinkle, and of course the old fashioned zinnia. Native plants to your area have evolved in a region for over hundreds of thousands of years adapting to the changing environment. These plants have thrived through the millennia and endured all kinds of weather extremes. So when it comes to low maintenance and hardiness, you can't go wrong with a native plant. Because they're so tough, they can sometimes become garden thugs. So before you plant a variety, check with your local garden center or cooperative extension service to make sure that it's not considered invasive. A few of my favorites for the sunny flower border include Blanket Flower, Black-Eyed Susans, Baptisia, Joe Pieweed, Laetrus, Purple Cone Flower, Goldenrod, Pinstemons, and Coreopsis. There are a few places where erosion can be an issue for us here at the farm, especially on some of the slopes. Tom Cates shows us an easy way to control this annoying problem by using pine straw. Here I'm going to show you how to install pine straw on a slope application. This bale is already busted for us. They come in uh, square bales, round bales, or bags. Um, this here is about the size of a broken down square bale. On the hillside application, you want to start on the top and work your way to the bottom just for a safety concern um, because backing up a hill backwards, it's slippery. You want to work your way to the bottom of the hill. On a hillside, you want to do three to four inches, um, a little thicker than what you do on a, on a flat surface just because you want to ensure you get adequate coverage because getting back on that hillside to, um, if you have some thin spots later on, you want to, it's hard to get back on the hillside to cover that up. So you want to go a little bit thicker. It gives you a little bit better coverage to ensure you won't have any thin spots. Just gently pull it apart, shake. You'll have some, some clumps that stick together. You know, just pull them apart, intertwines. That's what makes it so good on the hillside is it intertwines. So that's actually a benefit to you. Come over your edges, uh, two to three, maybe even four, four inches over the edge, and we'll show you how we're gonna tuck that here in just a moment. It does come out of the woods, so you'll have a few sticks and a few leaves. Um, a little bit is, is acceptable. You'll have some high spots that'll be um, 
may look to be clumped up, just go back and pull those apart. It'll settle, two or three days it'll settle and uh, it won't look quite as fluffy. Final step in the application process is tucking your edges. Two different options is the roll and tuck, which is the most common. Um, you just grab it underneath, kind of roll, it, it intertwines together, and you can come back up and clean up your excess. Um, another option is cut, taking an edger or a weed eater and cutting a straight edge and then coming back with a blower and tucking the excess under. That'll give it a real crisp look. Well, aside from the aesthetics of the pine straw, it's really functional on a hillside. It will not float or wash away like traditional mulches. It stays put through the summer and um, reapplied in the fall. Did you know that harvesting rainwater is beneficial for several reasons? First, rainwater is considered soft, which makes it a good option for watering your plants and flowers. Actually, the absence of those very chemicals that make tap water safe for drinking makes rainwater a better choice for your outdoor watering. Supplementing your watering needs with rainwater can also help reduce your utility bills during the summer. Plus, dirty rainwater that's released from storm drains directly into lakes and streams can cause big problems for plants and animals. Imagine the chemical stew that you see on the roadways like oil and antifreeze washing directly into your favorite brook or creek. Some municipalities these days have water restrictions that limit when and how often you can water your garden. But there's no restrictions on collecting rainwater and when you're allowed to use it. So check into rainwater harvesting. You'll be glad you did. You know, it's always fun to have parties and people out to the farm, and sometimes a galvanized container like this is perfect, particularly for that rural setting. But let's say you're getting ready for a wedding, or the galvanized look just doesn't work for you, but you need something to put drinks in. What I've done here is taken this particular galvanized container and begin to cover it with moss. I'm not quite finished yet, and it's really easy to do. You start with sheet moss and the spray-on adhesive. And all you do is go around from one side to the next, taking one and then moving it around and just layer the moss and it'll stick right to this. Let me show you how this works. You spray a little bit like this and then before it dries, and I like to start at the bottom and work my way up to the top like this. Now, so you get this all done and it's really quite beautiful. Let me turn it around so you can see here. You can decorate it any way you like. If you're having some sort of bridal affair, you could do whatever the theme color ribbon or uh, flowers that you want around the edge. Or if it's some sort of graduation party, you can decorate it as much or as little as you like. Now here's a creative way to keep dips or salads nice and cool. All you have to do is make an herb ice bowl. It's really easy to make. Take two stainless steel bowls. One should fit inside the other with about three quarters of an inch space between the two edges. You'll find that adding a little water to the larger bowl first, then placing the smaller bowl inside will help the small bowl float a little higher, which makes it easier to tape the sides together. Then all you have to do is go gather some of your favorite herbs clip them and take the cuttings and stuff them between the two bowls. You can use things like lavender, mint, lemon thyme, lemon balm, and even mosquito plant. These are just a few that are very aromatic and work really well. Next, pour the water between the bowls until it reaches the rim and place it in the freezer overnight. When you're ready to use your ice bowl, set it out for about 10 minutes at room temperature. Remove the tape from the sides and remove the ice bowl. This bowl is perfect for holding dips or salads at any function. Give it a try. When designing this rooftop garden for a local hospital, 
I needed a simple solution for watering. Jonathan Gillette tells us what he installed for the rooftop garden here. We are here today on a large commercial rooftop garden. It's an area just surrounded with uh, concrete and steel structure and wanted to bring plantings to this uh, arena to give it a soothing, uh, more pleasing effect. Obviously, uh, as you can see, there are no uh, planting beds here. Uh, we're on top of a concrete structure, so there was no way to uh, bring soil and plants into this area without providing uh, container plantings. One of the biggest challenges that uh, was faced on the project was uh, anytime you have container plantings is providing uh, irrigation and water to the plants. The way the water gets to the planting is through sub-irrigation and on the bottom of that reservoir there are little holes uh, that the water comes out of and water through capillary action will travel through any good soil planting mix upward. Water will not go down in soil until it hits a saturation point. Plants typically uh, suffer from one of two things. Uh, one is overwatering, and the other, of course, is underwatering, where plants uh, do, just are not getting enough attention. This project is a large container garden installation uh, where a lot of effort was uh, put into plant selection, uh, soil amendments, things of those nature, to bring a successful uh, green environment to uh, an otherwise concrete and steel environment. You can see here we've used uh, Gulfstream Nandinas, very large river birch, deodore cedars, American hollies. Simply by refilling the water reservoirs that we've installed in these containers uh, every couple weeks is going to uh, monitor the system, uh, monitor the watering for the plants, and allow these plants to continue to grow and provide a healthy environment here with very little uh, maintenance requirement. What do you think of the water feature we've added here at the farm? You know, there's just something magical about them, no matter their size. Water features can make, well, a space feel cooler on the hottest summer day. And the sound, well, it brings tranquility and a lovely quality of harmony to a space. And it attracts lots of wildlife in the way of frogs and dragonflies, not to mention all the songbirds that a watery oasis will draw. To make a water feature an attractive addition to your landscape, there are a few pointers you may want to follow. When trying to decide how big to make your water feature, consider two factors, the size of your property and the time you have to maintain the water. As with any garden element, whether it be plants, a path, containers, or a piece of furniture, it's important to select objects that are in scale with their surroundings. If you have a small garden or a patio terrace, a tabletop container or a wall-hung fountain could be just the right size. Of course, medium-sized gardens could accommodate a larger feature. You can do things that are very creative, like a standalone fountain or a small in-ground pool. Certainly, properties with sizable yards or gardens are perfect for full-size ponds. Also, keep in mind that the bigger your water garden, the more pumps, plants, and fish you'll have to add to it, and the more time and money you'll spend maintaining it. Now, before you dig a large hole for a pool or set up a fountain, you want to think about, really, the purpose of it. One of the things that I like to use them for is a focal point in a garden. When you see this pool, you come through a hedge and it serves as a focal point for this space. The best location for a water garden, in my opinion, is near where you're going to spend most of your time outdoors. Resist the urge to place the water feature in the back corner of your property. If you're adding a fountain, you want to place it where you can hear it from inside your home. The sound is really lovely. And make sure it's near an outdoor outlet where you can plug it in and consult with an electrician to be certain that your outlets provide proper protection for an outdoor water feature. Now to enhance the beauty of your water garden, add plants and accessories to help blend in with the setting. Whimsical accessories such as ceramic frogs, favorite stones from your travels, or a statue that reflects your garden's theme help add some personality. You may want to use these items in moderation though so the scene doesn't become cluttered. Many people go back and forth about whether the pool or water feature should be formal or informal. When it's informal like this, I love to use all kinds of native plants around it to make sure that it blends into the setting as much as possible. Either way you go, formal or informal, 
A water feature like this can add so much harmony to your garden. A great gift idea for the holidays is to make homemade bath salts. It's really easy to do. Simply combine one cup of fine sea salt with a fourth a cup of coarse sea salt and a fourth a cup of dried herbs into a food processor. It's best to use fragrant herbs such as lavender or mint. Now here we used mint. You'll want to blend this in the food processor for about a minute on high, which will produce a fine powder. Then pour the blended mixture into a sandwich bag and add about a fourth of a cup of baking powder. Seal the bag and shake vigorously to mix all the ingredients together. Finally, take the contents of the bag and pour it into a decorative airtight container. Get really creative. You see, this will make a personal gift for someone very special. You won't believe what I have in this box. They are so adorable and I've just moved them out of one brooder and getting ready to move them into another. Yep, baby ducklings, but just not any ordinary duck. This is an Aylesbury duck. And as you can see, these little guys aren't very old. This one came out of the incubator, or I should say the hatcher, about uh, four or five days ago, but already full of vitality and ready to swim. They instinctively go for water just as soon as they're born. They just love it. And what's great about an Aylesbury is that it's an old breed, an English breed, bred for its meat and appearance. Now, the adults are pure white and they're big fluffy ducks, like storybook ducks. Aylesbury's are very hardy. They can take cold conditions, withstanding freezing rain and snow right through the winter months. The adults don't need much protection from weather, but these little guys do. You see, it takes 28 days once the duck egg is placed either under the mother duck or in an incubator to hatch. Now, the temperature and humidity while they're in the incubator is very important. The temperature needs to be around 98 degrees and the higher humidity is better for ducks in particular. Now, what happens is as soon as you begin to see the eggshell pip, and you know this is gonna happen just a, maybe a day before the 28th day, you move the eggs, all of them, over into the hatcher, which has similar conditions. And it's in that hatcher that the ducks come out of the shell. And it's really quite exciting to see them pip through the, the egg and, and fill the entire floor of the hatcher. And then very soon after that, we move them over into a brooder, which has a similar temperature. And each week, we allow the temperature to go down just a little bit as they mature. And it's amazing how fast these little guys grow. These in this pen are only about three weeks older than this little guy, and you can just see that they're already three or four times the size. Now you may ask, why are we raising these ducks here? Well, they're adorable, and uh, who can resist them? But there's a more important reason. This particular breed is on the critical list uh, by the ALBC, which is the American Livestock Breed Conservancy. And they think that there are probably fewer than 500 possibly as few as 200 of these birds left in the country. And while 500 may seem like a large population, it's really not, particularly when you think that most of these birds are probably in flocks of less than seven or eight. So to get genetic diversity, you really need a larger population to draw from. So what we're doing here is we have three different strains of Aylesberries that have been collected around the country. And we're bumping up the numbers. In fact, this year we've hatched over 100 ducklings from three different genetic lines. Now you see our hope here is that by next year, these little ducklings will be adults and laying, and we'll be able to produce as many as five or 600 Aylesberries. So as you can see, the population will grow, we'll have greater genetic diversity, and these guys will have a chance of being saved and we can get them off the critically endangered list. Welcome to my design studio. I love getting photographs from you and tinkering around with ideas for your landscape improvements. Now, we have a house that's in a very urban situation. It's Shona and she lives in Ontario, so it's very cold there in the winter. Now she points out that this big Norway maple to the left of the house 
is a problem. It's difficult growing things under it, uh, but she doesn't want to take it down. So uh, she also says that she loves Japanese gardens. So I'm thinking we ought to take a very minimalist approach to this, to this place, to the front of this house. Um, so let's talk about the colors for just a minute because there's a lot going on here. Uh, we need to get uh, rid of this green. You see this green over here? It needs to be white. We need to come up with one consistent color all the way around. This needs to go. That needs to be white, white. And I wouldn't even do it white. I would do kind of an off-white, a warmer color white. And then here, under, under the, the house, this underpinning, all of this needs to go away. It needs to be painted a really dark chocolate brown. And I would do the rise uh, of the steps in chocolate brown too. And then I would think about the porch color and the top of the steps, what, what color that might be. You could explore this gray, that's fine, but you might even want to use a really nice sort of uh, mossy green would be lovely here, okay? So I think we need to deal with the color and get that taken care of first. All right, the next thing I want you to think about is how we can get something planted here that's green throughout the entire year. Um, I think that we need to do away with these cross ties or these landscape timbers around this tree and probably get rid of this, this shrub uh, because it just looks random. Uh, there's some plantings along here that seem to be doing well. Uh, so I think we could leave those from here to here. But then I would like to encourage you to think about an upright U here, and maybe an upright U here, and an upright U here. Um, those are evergreens and would create this rhythm going across the front of the house. And then it would be fun to, to maybe look at one of the Japanese maples here, just in this bed alone. One of those deeply uh, dissected, the leaf is very almost filigree-like with all of the deep cuts in it. So a Japanese maple there. We've done away with this shrub. Um, it would be great to carry this U hedge over here on this other side to block out some of the view of this uh, uh, adjacent building over here. Um, and that would be right at the edge of this road that runs on the side of the house. And then the landscape itself, uh, the landscape or the field here really should be all Vinca Minor. All Vinca Minor here. And then what I would do is do Vinca Minor all over here, keep it very, very simple. And then have pockets, pockets of bulbs that would come up. Uh, you talk about how much you like Siberian Scylla. Um, so those bluebells that could come up through uh, in the spring would be beautiful, as well as some of the dwarf or miniature uh, daffodils in here would be really beautiful. They'd die back down, so you would have this mass planting of, of ground cover, and then up through it would come these beautiful bulbs in the spring. I hope that helps. I think that uh, simplifying it, taking a more minimalist approach to this is the way to go. Good luck. You know, there's just nothing like the sound of running water in a garden. It's very tranquil and alluring. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.